Well, Jesus is our surprising Savior. Now, let me ask you a question. When it comes to Christmas, have you ever been surprised? You ever get a surprise gift? My grandpa used to always try to surprise my grandmother. He would get a gift or so and put it under the tree, and she would open it, and he would act like that was it, and then he would make a big show of about bringing out another gift, and then another gift, and then another gift, and he did it every year at Christmas, and even as his grandson, I could see that coming a mile away. Uh, So it probably was a surprise at one time, but after a while, everybody just got used to the routine. Well, what Jesus did for us was definitely a surprise. He is our surprising Savior. I remember the most surprising, maybe not the, the most surprising, one of the most surprising gifts I ever got um, and was one of the favorite gifts that I ever got. I was 10 years old and I got a wrist rocket slingshot. Now, how many of you grew up in a time when uh, parents didn't care about their children's safety like I did, right? Never did I wear a seatbelt. Um, you know, they would put us outside all day and threaten to spank us if we came inside. If we wanted to get water, we had to drink out of the water hose. And yet, somehow, we survived. Well, that wrist rocket was certainly a surprise to me. Um, and it was also a surprise to many a squirrel many a bird, and to my sister, all right? So uh, after a while, I got that wonderful gift taken away from me because I shot my sister one time too many with the wrist rocket. Well, maybe uh, you have had a surprise that wasn't a gift. My sister, um, she has a, I'm sorry, not a Doberman, but a Great Dane, And it's a female, and she's just a little bit over a year old. She's a beautiful dog. It's a wonderful pet. Um, She used to like my dad. And my sister would take uh, the dog over to my dad and mom's house. And this dog loved my dad. My dad took the dog on a walk one day. And they went by this pasture. Now, there were cows in there, but there were also some donkeys in there. And the pasture was surrounded by an electric fence. So my dad is walking this dog. And she sees the donkeys in the pasture. And she goes up to investigate. Well, what she did not realize that when she put her cold, wet nose against that electric fence, that it shocked her. It shocked her so badly. She took off running and went all the way back home. And to this day... She thinks that my dad did it to her. We were at my parents' house at Thanksgiving, and the dog would not even take bacon from my dad's hand. She would just growl at him every time she sees him. And my sister tells me that even when they're driving down the road, if she sees a donkey in a pasture, she begins to bark uncontrollably. Now, the dog definitely got a surprise. It was not a good surprise. But I think there's an illustration there. If you're not careful, you'll cling to the past. And then you'll blame somebody for it that never did it. How many times do we have bad things happen in our life and we blame God? We're angry at God. This dog is angry at my dad for no reason. My dad did nothing to the dog. But the dog doesn't have enough sense to know that, and the dog is angry at my dad still. Now, the truth is, for you and me, you and I, you know what we can do? We can get angry at God when things happen, when things surprise us. But the beauty of what I'm going to read to you today shows us how that even during surprises in our life, even during difficult times in our life, that Jesus is not just our surprising Savior, but He is the good Savior. He is the Son of God, and He is a wonderful gift to us. Well, I'm going to read today from a non-traditional passage of Scripture when it comes to Christmas. Now, there are four Gospels in the New Testament. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Most of us will read the Gospel of Matthew, that Christmas story, Or the most famous is really the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, that Christmas story. 
But did you know that all of the Gospels have uh, somewhat of a form of a Christmas story? The Gospel of Mark has the shortest, and uh, it opens, and it says, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's all uh, of the Christmas story that we got. It was the beginning of the Gospel of of Jesus Christ. And that's what the gospel is. That's what the Christmas story is. It's the beginning of the gospel. Well, one that you may not associate with Christmas, but actually has great meaning about Christmas, is found in the gospel of John. John chapter 1. And once again, just like the gospel of Mark, it talks about the beginning, the beginning of things. Whereas Mark And Matthew and Luke talked about the beginning of Jesus' earthly life. John showed us that Christmas began way, 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 way before Jesus was ever born in a manger. So read with me in John chapter 1. And I'll read the first five verses and then we'll skip down to verse 9 and read a few verses as well. In the beginning was the Word... Now, this is important that you know this. This Greek word for the word word is logos or logos, however you feel like pronouncing that word. And it is about a written word. It's about that which is recorded for us. Jesus was the word. There's no argument against him. He is the real deal. But you've often heard me quote Romans 10, 17, uh, about increasing our faith. It says for uh, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But the Greek word that's used there is not the word logos, but the word rhema. Do you know the difference? Uh, the, the word of God is recorded for us and that is the logos of God. Uh, Jesus Christ is without doubt the son of God. He is the logos of God. There's no arguing it. It is, it is real and tangible, and we can put our fingers on it. But the word rhema is when God speaks to you through his word. Have you ever had one of those moments that you read something from the Bible, and it's like a light bulb comes on in your light, in your mind? Have you ever been praying about something, and you read something that really has nothing to do with what you're praying about, but it's like the exact moment, the exact thing that you needed to hear from God, that is a rhema word. And the Bible is very clear that Jesus is the logos of God, and the written word of God is the logos of God, but God speaks to us in ways that are not Uh, It's not adding to the Word of God, but it's making the Word of God come alive. I had a rhema word when we started this church. Uh, Many of you know the story. I decided I was going to go on a 40-day fast, uh, seeking God's will. At the time, I was in evangelism. I was traveling all over the world, preaching in churches and conferences and in business uh, settings and all kinds of things. But I felt God tugging my heart to start a church or or to get back in church ministry. I was actually not wanting to start a church, but I was looking maybe to go to an established church and uh, become the pastor there. And during this time, there was a a specific prayer that I was praying because I asked God why, and here's the words I used with God, why would you bring me out of where I was in ministry to try to lead me into something else. And I was reading from the New Living Translation in the book of Exodus, and God spoke these words to Moses. He said, I brought you out that I might bring you in to the land of promise. Now, the real meaning of that is that God was promising to deliver the nation of Israel to the promised land. But that was a light bulb moment in my life. It was a rhema word of God that God literally led me through the rhema word. Now, the reason I tell you that is because the living word, the living word of God, according to Hebrews, the word of God is alive, it's powerful, It discerns your thoughts and the intentions of your heart. 
uh, the living word of God is Jesus Christ. The living word of God becomes alive to you through the rhema word of God. When God speaks to you, God can speak to you when you listen to a message that's being preached from Scripture. God can speak to you when you read the Bible in your private devotions or you listen to it in your car when you're driving back and forth to work. Very important. In the beginning was the Word, that's Jesus, and the Word was with God. So Jesus did not begin when he was born. He was in eternity past. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's the beginning of the Christmas story. That before he was ever on this earth, he was already the Word of God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, in the Bible, you often will read uh, something that's stated positively, and then it'll state the same thing negatively. And it's just a real emphasis on what was being written. For example, all things were made through him. He made everything. And without him, nothing was made that was made. So it was a double um, uh, a double mention so that it can make an emphasis that God was creator, but that Jesus was the creator. He was in the beginning with God. And in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world, and he was in the world, and the world was made through him. And yet the world did not know him. Of course they did not. He was born from a virgin. He was born and placed in a stable. Uh, He didn't have a famous family. He was not in the palace. But he came so that normal people like you and me, so that normal people could relate to Jesus Christ. He came into the world. They didn't recognize him. He came to his own, his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, here's the promise, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. So God sent Jesus into the world to become human. He was God, he is God, and not everyone recognized him, but he did it so that when you believe in him, he gives you the right to become the children of God. Isn't that amazing? It's through the birth and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And these people were born not of blood. In other words, they weren't born, uh, you know, just physically, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. This is a spiritual rebirth he's talking about. And the Word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. In case you're missing what he had already said. He's repeating it again and again. So it's important. Jesus became flesh. Jesus became human. That's important. And it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes before me ranks before me, or who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Let me just pause and say, thank God for grace, but thank God more for grace upon grace. You see, God gives you grace, but you and I are gonna blow it We're going to mess it up. We're going to sin even after we get saved and God gives us some more grace. You need grace to go through what you're going through right now, but there also comes a time that you're going to need some more grace because you're going to go through something else that's difficult in the future. You're going to need grace upon grace. And Jesus gives that. For the law was given through Moses and grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad for that today, that grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ? Well, I'm going to talk about that just a little bit. Our surprising Savior, and here's the first thought, he surprised us that he came. Does anybody else here ever just wonder 
and marvel at the love of God to send his only son? I mean, the truth is, I understand it. I know it's in his character. I know that he gives grace. He did it to save us. But I marvel that he knows us better than anyone, and yet he loves us more than anyone. The truth is, I don't deserve that love. I don't deserve that grace, but he gives it freely. He surprised us that he came. Have you ever considered the wonder about how Jesus came to be the sacrifice for our sins? It's not like he didn't know why he was coming to earth. He knew he was born to die. There were several promises that were filled, fulfilled because Jesus came. One was he was the promised seed of the woman in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. After Adam and Eve had sinned and God was cursing uh, the, the serpent, which was Satan, okay. Um, he said, um, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. And by the way, if you're wondering who that is, in the New Testament, Jesus said that those that are of their father, the devil, in other words, they have not come to Jesus Christ, they're not part of the seed of the Son of God, uh, those that are, have rejected Christ. He talks about the devil being a liar and the father of lies, and he has come to steal, to kill, and destroy. Uh, those that are of their father, the devil, that's that seed. He said, I'll put enmity between your seed and the seed of the woman. Now, who is the seed of the woman? Well, that Hebrew word could mean offspring of the woman, but most scholars throughout the ages have said that is a reference to Jesus Christ himself. Jesus promised that he was going to come. And notice what God said would happen when he did come. He, talking to the devil, shall uh, bruise your head. That word there means to crush your head. You ever crush the head or cut off the head of a snake? I have. I grew up as a redneck on a farm in North Carolina. And my grandpa was deathly afraid of snakes. I was never afraid of snakes. Somehow or another, I'm afraid of spiders, but not snakes. I know that doesn't make sense. I've actually caught rattlesnakes and copperheads and water moccasins with my bare hands. Okay? Not, I say bare hands. I have a stick, and I'm like, pin them down, and I grab them by the back of the neck and uh, hold their head. And so uh, there would be times when the poisonous snake, we normally don't kill snakes because they help control the rodents and all this kind of stuff. But there were times that, you know, there are children around, and we're going we're gonna to crush the head of the snake or cut off the head of the snake. You know why we did that? Because we wanted to kill the snake. You know what Jesus is saying? He said, he's going to bruise your head. He's going to crush your head. He is going to totally annihilate you. How did he do that? Well, in the way that the serpent or Satan bruised his heel. How many know that a head wound is fatal, but a foot wound is a mere inconvenience? What Jesus promised to do when uh, God the Father promised that he was going to come, he was promising that he was going to overcome Satan. It was the story of the gospel. And as Mark said, it was the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He fulfilled um, the promise that he would be the one through whom all the world will be blessed. This promise was given to Abraham, Genesis 12, 3. It says, everyone on earth will be blessed because of you. He was talking about Jesus, that everyone has an opportunity to come to the Father because of Jesus Christ. He is our surprising Savior. Surprises us that he came. Then he was the promised son in Isaiah. Listen to Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. He was the promised Savior it surprised us that he came. 
Now, I don't have time to unpack all of the stuff that's in these verses in John chapter 1. But let me just give you some highlights about who Jesus is and why it's so surprising that he came. He is the eternal word. He is without end. He is the eternal son. He has that relationship with the Father forever and a relationship with us forever. He is God. He is the sole creator. It didn't happen through accident. It happened through the will and the word of God. He is a source of all life. It talks about Jesus being the light of men, the life. He is the source of all life. Uh, everything has its source in Jesus Christ. And everything will one day uh, be fulfilled when Jesus comes again and sets up after his second coming into eternity. Everything, the curse is going to be lifted off the earth. Isn't that going to be wonderful? I mean, you'll be able to grow things in your garden without weeds and without, I mean, you'll probably want to tend it, but it's not going to be hard. It's going to be wonderful. Can you imagine how wonderful the food is going to taste that grows when there is no curse on the earth? Can you imagine how good that's going to be? Uh, Jesus is the source of all life. Every animal, every human, every bird, every fish, every amoeba, everything has the beginning of its life in him. And I love how it says in Genesis that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, let me just tell you something. There may be some of you that have differing viewpoints on the first three chapters of Genesis, and that's okay. Some people believe that those are literal 24-hour days. Some people believe that those days were longer periods of time. That's what I happen to believe. And there are others that believe that, uh, you know, God... Uh, throughout eons of time began to, to work and form the earth. But here's what I know. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It doesn't matter where you come down on. God didn't, in fact, put Genesis in there to give us a science lesson. He put that in there to give us a faith lesson. Because don't miss the point of the narrative of creation. Here it is. There is an eternal God that stands above all others and he alone is to be worshiped. We're responsible to him. We're accountable to him. And that's the message. And don't miss it. He was and is the source of all life. He is the source of eternal life. He is the eternal light. And I love that on uh, day one of creation, it says, God said, let there be light. And I believe Jesus is the source of all light. Did you know that scientists have discovered that at the very basic building blocks of our bodies and of everything literally in the earth, down to the atomic level and even smaller, that... Um, that one of the main components is, is space, believe it or not. And you know what another main component is? It's light. Light. You were made to be the light of the world. You were made in the image of God. He is the eternal light. And man, it surprised us that he came. Um, that light conquers darkness, by the way. And the darkness cannot overcome it. Aren't you glad that Jesus can't be defeated? Aren't you glad that no matter what you're going through, Jesus wins? I love that. Here's the second thing. He surprised us how he came. Not just that he came, but our surprising Savior surprises us how he came. How did he come? He came to his own creation. He became what he created in order to save us. I don't know about you, but that's mind-boggling to me. If we could get off our devices and off of social media long enough actually to sit and think, I highly recommend it. Just being able to sit 
and think, if it's only for five or 10 minutes to connect with God, to pray, to read the word of God, to sit and think and meditate, it's amazing what will happen in your life if you'll just take the time to do that. He came, he became what he created to save us. That's mind blowing. It surprises us how he came. He also came in humility. In the book of Philippians, it talks about the humility of Jesus Christ. But listen there in in John 1. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came into his own and his own people did not even receive him. Isaiah chapter 53 tells us that there was no beauty that we should desire him. That doesn't mean that Jesus was ugly. He could have been very handsome as far as we know. We we don't really know. But the point was that it wasn't like some angelic being. It wasn't like some superhero levitating above the earth. He was a normal human being. Well, except for the part of being the son of God. But he lived like you and I would live. He was the son of a carpenter. And I've told you before, the one that created the heavens and the earth, the one that formed Mars, the one that put the stars in place, allowed a human stepfather to teach him how to hold a hammer and a chisel. That's humility. Listen to uh, Philippians chapter 2. Your attitude should be that that was shown us by Jesus Christ, who, though he was God, did not demand and cling to his rights as God. And what that means is he laid aside some of those privileges of being God in order to become human. He constrained himself to the need to sleep and to eat, just like you and and I, okay? Uh, Jesus wasn't some superhuman person, that didn't need to eat or didn't need to sleep. I don't believe that, you know, his mom had problems with him trying to give him a bath and he walked on water as a baby. I I don't believe that was the problem, okay? But Jesus laid aside those, those rights. He laid aside his mighty power and glory, taking the disguise of a slave, and becoming like men. And he humbled himself even further, going so far as actually to die a criminal's death on a cross. Man, he just surprised us how he came. He came and he was accused falsely. Yet it was because of this that God raised him up to the heights of heaven and gave him a name which is above every other name that in the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I say amen to that. Amen to that. Hey, it surprises us that he came, and it surprises us how he came. And then I close with this thought. He surprised us why he came. Why did he come? He came to save us. But to all who receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God this Christmas. The good news is, No matter what difficulties you face, no matter how lonely you may feel, no matter how depressed or how stressed you may feel, Jesus came to make you his son or daughter. Good news. Good news. Hey, you know what? If your favorite dessert burns and it just totally upsets you because you've got a judgmental mother-in-law that's coming to your house, And she just, you know, puts the white glove on and tests to see if there's dust in your house or if you, uh, look, I recommend for a woman like that, being nice, be nice, but do what I did with my mother-in-law, who's a wonderful, wonderful woman. Kim and I were engaged. We were just a few weeks from getting married and we were having a conversation about what God had called us to do and where we were moving and My mother-in-law said, well, it's none of my business, but, and she went on and told me what she thought. And I looked at her and I said, Jackie, you are right. That's none of your business. (laughs) 
And it kind of offended her, to be honest, but because she's such a wonderful woman and has been, literally, I could not have asked for a better mother-in-law, so supportive and loving of us. But sometimes, maybe, uh, some of you might need to kind of make a decision when it comes to family. Have you ever noticed that sometimes family can be so ugly? I don't mean the way they look. Just the way they act. Anybody, don't raise your hand. She may be watching. All right, so, but anybody have a mother-in-law or even a mom that puts the guilt trip on you? Well, you've been at our house at Christmas every year since you were born. I hope you're not planning on missing this year. Yeah, thank you, mom. You know, I have, you know, I'm married and I have kids and I have in-laws and uh, we have to go out of town. And uh, thank you for the extra stress. Sometimes you got to make a decision and say, you know what? We have our own family now. We love you and we'll work it out. You know what Kim and I have done with our kids? And I'm just giving you kind of lessons here. Um, Because our kids, they have extended family, in-laws and so forth, and they have jobs. You know what we decided that we were going to do? We decided that the exact day didn't matter. We like to get together at Thanksgiving, whether it's the Saturday before or the Saturday after or the Monday or the Sunday before or after because it's not important that it's on Thursday. You don't have to watch football. If you want to watch football on Thanksgiving and you can't meet with your kids on Thanksgiving Day, record it and play it back. That'll make make you feel better. But the point is this, you got to make some choices, okay? Now, I realize I'm veering off topic a little bit here, but this is good. This will help you, okay? You got to make your own choices, your own family decisions. Don't do with your kids what so many people do. Put stress on them at the holidays that makes everybody walk on eggshells. Celebrate when you get a chance. That's what's important. Not the day. Well, we're going to meet on Christmas Day by God or you know, it's going to hair lip the devil, you know. Well, good luck with having your kids wanting to hang around you, okay? So, and the point is that even when you feel stressed at Christmas, he came to bring grace. He came to bring grace and truth. Um, from, the full, from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came. Through Jesus Christ. Now, let me just challenge us with this and I close. That you and I need to be filled with grace and truth just like Jesus. Now, you, you got to work at that. Grace and truth. You see, truth comes from the logos, the written word of God. Grace comes from the rhema, that special way that God speaks to you that increases your faith. You need grace and truth. A a church without grace and only truth, man, they get it right. They interpret scripture to the best of their ability right. They're correct, but nobody wants to go there. They're just judgmental and rock throwers, and all they do is just beat you over the head. Every time you go there, you feel like you've been beaten up. That's what truth without grace looks like. And I've seen churches that have a lot of grace, but they don't really live by the truth of the Word of God. It's just whatever. And whatever society says, that's what we're going to do. We're going to embrace it. Now, you know that our uh, mission statement here is bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Everyone, I mean everyone, is welcome at this church. Welcome to come. But we will not shy away from giving you the truth as well as grace. I've had numerous people that were members of our church, and uh, they, at the time when they started coming, kind of angry with God, and they were living, I'll just, I'm not going to get into specifics, but they were living lifestyles that were not conducive to living by truth from the Word of God. I'll just say it that way. And yet they began to come here, and, and you know, you ever seen those people that have that you know, that written across their forehead that, you know, they're just not going to enjoy 
or appreciate anything because they got the defensive walls up. You've seen people like that. They just look mad. They're in church, but they're mad about it, you know? And I've seen so many people have that look, and yet, because we have grace, because no matter who you are, I don't care how good you are, if Billy Graham, of course, he's dead now, but if Billy Graham were to be a member of this church, that would be weird because he's dead, but uh, if he were to be a member of this church, he would tell you the same thing. That you've got to love everyone. You've got to be welcoming to everyone. Because, I mean, what if the hospitals operated like the churches? And whenever you needed help, maybe you had a heart attack, maybe you have cancer, maybe you were in a car accident. And what if after the emergency vehicle took you to the hospital, they said, well, good news, as soon as you get better, you can come on back and we're going to treat you. You're like, wait, 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 I'm here because I'm, I'm, I've got a broken arm or I, I've got a disease or I'm about to have a heart attack. I, I need help now. You know, a lot of churches act like that. They tell people, well, as soon as you get your act together, you can come on down. You can join us. You look like us and smell like us and drink like us and everything else like us, then good news, you can come and be a part. That's not the way Jesus was. But by the same token, we must have grace and truth. I can't tell you the number of people that, as I was saying, they started coming to this church and they were living a a lifestyle that I clearly teach from the Word of God that you're not supposed to live but we do it in grace. And I've seen so many people get their lives right with God. They get saved. They begin to serve the Lord. They begin to be generous and really to grow spiritually. And I can't tell you the number of those people that I've hugged their neck and tell tell them I'm so proud of them. And I have some of them that have moved away to other states and they're looking for a church. And I've had people contact me and say, why can't we find a church like what we had there. And I always tell them the same thing. It's not because of programming, because there's a lot of churches, they have a lot more money than we do, and they've got some pretty awesome programming. Pretty awesome lights and sound and video. But it's not because of that. It's because we have grace, but we also have truth. And when you combine those things, you see, the point is that truth is what helps you Truth is what helps you turn your life around. Jesus was being loving when he told people that were living in sin to stop doing it. Not because he was mean, but because he was loving. When you know that the consequences of sin are extremely high, you know what the devil tries to convince us of? That the freedom to sin. Now, God does give you a free choice. He gives you free will. But the freedom to reject Jesus and to sin, that's not freedom at all. That's bondage. And when you look at the results of that, inevitably, 100% of the time, later on, your life is crushed by that. But when you give your life to Jesus Christ and you say, well, I may not want to stop doing this thing But because Jesus said, that's not what I'm supposed to do, I'm going to try it for a while. When you begin to live that way, you know what happens? Blessings begin to come in your life that are so overwhelming that before long you look back on that. And I can't tell you the number of conversations I've had with people in this church. I just can't believe I used to do that. That was so silly. Why did I say that I was so determined to live that way. I'm so glad that Jesus changed my life. I'm so glad that he delivered me. And friend, he will do the same for you. Why? Because that's the reason he came. He came to save us. He came to deliver us. Truth without grace is hurtful. Grace without truth is harmful. But truth and grace together are helpful. And that's what Jesus wants you to know. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us today. Um, At this Christmas week, 
that we would rejoice about that you came, how you came, and why you came. Help us to revel in that. Help us to praise you for that. God, I pray that you just help us today. Now, before I finish my prayer, I wonder if there's anyone that needs to receive that grace today for salvation. If so, you can say something like this to Jesus. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you're the Son of God. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and to save me. I commit my life to you. You say, well, I I just now said that prayer and I didn't have some kind of like religious experience. I didn't see angels in the room. Just look up here on stage, all right? You remember that I taught from the book of Revelation that the word angel means pastor. So if you need to see an angel, just look right up here, all right? That just means messenger is all it means. But here's what I know. When you commit your life to Jesus Christ, he'll save you. It's the prayer that he always answers. And so today, if you pray to receive Christ, take that next step card and mark on it and drop it either at the, uh, the guest services here to my right and your left as you exit the building or drop it in one of the offering baskets that we have available for you on the way out. But I wonder if there's anybody that would say, we don't need to keep our heads bowed for this, but I wonder if there's anybody that would say, Pastor, I need some more grace and truth in my life. I need some more of what Jesus gives. I need more grace, especially during the holidays. You know, I've got in-laws that are coming that just make me want to grind my teeth. I need some grace, but we also need the truth of the Word of God. How many would say, Pastor, pray for me I need a little more grace and a little more truth. Anybody like that? Hands raised. I got my hand raised. If you don't have your hand raised, God bless you. We're all coming to your house for Christmas. (laughs) Let's finish our prayer. Father, I pray that you bless us today. Help us to rejoice that grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And I pray that you bless us this Christmas. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.